G'day guys, welcome back to True Footy for finally what is probably almost certainly the final trade video that I'll be doing, or at least a video about the 2021 AFL trade period. Today we've got a pretty important task of trying to assess who were the winners and losers of the last 10 or so days of action or whatever it was. I think it's fair to suggest this is one of the more low key trade periods. Uh, I think if it, as well, if you sort of like extrapolate the last few years, the way it's been building, and you look at the 2020 trade period in particular, where there was some explosive movements, some really shocking stories that went all the way to the deadline minute. By contrast, this year was very, very low key and some I'd say probably no genuine A graders actually moved clubs this year, which was quite a quite a different look. Hawthorne sort of threatened it. You know, they tried to offload, you know, a couple of maybe not A graders, but perhaps Tom Mitchell, I guess, is probably the main A grader they were linked to moving. But obviously that strategy sort of fell flat and they couldn't quite get anyone out the door and uh, no top 10 to 15 picks came in the door either. So with that being said, there's still plenty of the action to unpack. And in this video, I'm basically going to be trying to look at which teams were the most productive and were the most effective at achieving their goals um, and there's a few that come to mind and in terms of losers as well it's hard to you know use the label loser in terms of trade period we're not going to know for a long time but maybe some teams to highlight that may have lost more than they brought in so we'll get into all of that and before we do guys as always I will invite you to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already according to the analytics it does say that more than half of you who do watch these videos uh, not actually subscribed to the channel. So as I always ask, really appreciate it if you would consider subscribing, particularly if you want to, you know, stay tuned for all the draft content we've got coming up, but also, you know, next season and beyond. True Footy is going to get bigger and bigger, we hope. And on top of that, don't forget to check out the sponsors of the channel, manscaped.com for 20% off and free shipping on their elite male grooming products. You can head to their website and use the code TRUEFOOTY20, all caps, all one word at checkout, and you get a great discount and free shipping. So why not check it out? But without further ado, we'll crack into the this particular analysis and I'm going to start with a team that I think was probably the most productive this trade period at least in terms of achieving their desired outcomes. I'm going to highlight Carlton and they're a team that's been productive over the last few I think you know spending big in previous years on Zach Williams Adam Saad, Jack Martin the year before that as well in terms of the contracts and trying to immediately improve their best 22. And I think they've put their best foot forward this year and certainly done that. They've addressed their weakness of what I would say is a pretty shallow midfield. Some of those high draft picks haven't really quite turned out yet, but they've really strengthened in that area this offseason, acquiring Adam Chera, who I would say is probably the most talented kid to swap clubs this offseason, giving up pick six and a future third for that. They acquired George Hewitt from the Sydney Swans as a free agent as well. So didn't have to give up a pick, just had to, you know, pay his contract. And then Lewis Young also made his way to the Blues. What went out? Well, in terms of their best 22, it was just Sam petrevsky Seaton. It's probably debatable whether you even consider Sam petrevsky Seaton Carlton's best 22, considering he uh, didn't play the full season in that side. But in terms of established players, that is who left the club, along with pick six, of course, for the Adam Chera deal. So the picks that they currently hold in this upcoming draft are 25, 64, and 82. So no first round selection for the second year in a row. But that's all right, in my opinion. I think Carlton's probably past the point where they really need to keep relying on top 10 picks. You know, you've got someone like a Paddy Dow really yet to uh, assert himself yet. And then, uh, you know, Lockie O'Brien was just delisted as well, may get picked up as a rookie. But you'd like to think there's a little bit more confidence in a player who's traded in. Someone like an Adam Chera, I think, is uh, certainly going to be probably their second best mid or third best, depending on whether Cripps gets his act together. And on top of that, you know, Carlton have a, a few young guys uh, that were former top 20 picks that we haven't seen too much of, like Kemp and Philp in particular. Liam Stock is also sort of plying his trade, I think, as a defender last we heard. So it's good for them to get some more mature talent into the list. In terms of the future picks, Carlton uh, did lose that future third for next year's draft in that Adam Chera deal, but they still hold their first two picks in next year's draft. So they haven't really sold the farm to get in some pretty good players. It's also worth noting they got their deals done pretty uh, efficiently, you would say. The Chera deal didn't take too long at all. And uh, Sam petrovsky Seaton moving to West Coast happened fairly quickly as well. I think if you could be a little critical, I think some Carlton fans were a little disappointed Pointed that Sam petrovsky Seaton exited the club for, you know, a late third rounder or whatever it was. Pick 52 overall, but they did turn that into Lockie Young as well. So they've added to a weakness in the list, which was probably some key position depth. Is Young going to play a single game for them? Well, I'm probably not the man to ask. I haven't seen a whole lot of him. It's probably a long shot that he's going to become an elite player by any stretch, but at least they've highlighted a weakness there. And in terms of not getting, you know, true value for SPS, I've kind of made my opinion clear before. I think 52 was the way it was always headed when a guy plays 100 games, finds himself 
finds himself out of the best 22. They did the right thing by Sam and uh, got the deal done fairly quickly so he could move home. So all in all, I think Carlton's done a really good job of improving their best 22 this offseason. And that's why I have them as one of the biggest winners of this trade period. Next up, and uh, not necessarily the second biggest winner, but I'm kind of just rattling through in a general order of winners. I'm going to highlight Collingwood here for doing a pretty good job this offseason of achieving their goals. Uh, they've brought in Nathan Kruger and Lipinski. Kruger is sort of like a developing toll that's been on Geelong's list. I don't know too much about him, but I guess, you know, feels a list need for them, I presume, and still in the right age profile. So maybe a token trade in hindsight, but maybe he comes good. We don't really know yet. Lipinski is the one that's probably a, a better chance to really become best 22 before long. And I think that's a, a pretty astute pickup considering their list profile to get another young midfielder who, in, who can sort of contribute straight away. And for the cost of pick 43 as well, because he was out of contract, they've done fairly well there. They did lose Max Lynch, but again, he's only played three games, so hard to be too critical of that. Where I think Collingwood did very well this particular trade period was actually loading up on some draft picks. Because if you'll recall, they started this trade period without enough picks to match a bid for Nick Dacos if it came in the first two or even three picks. What they did do was get very active in trading away their future picks. They traded away their future second, third, and fourth round selections on day one of this trade period with the Gold Coast Suns, who were trying to trade into the future draft but managed to find their way back to getting three future third rounders anyway. So their draft position next year is actually not too bad. And they've more than made up for that having, you know, six picks in the top 58, if I read that correctly, and the earliest of which is 27 as well. So the thing about Collingwood here is they're probably getting the second best kid in the draft or even the first best, depending on who you ask. I think Toomey was saying a while ago, Dacos was better than Horn Francis. And a lot of other people think Horn Francis is the clear choice, but either way, they're getting probably picked two overall, which is ironically where they, they finished in the, uh, in the actual ladder anyway. But the cool thing for Collingwood here is that they can sort of be creative on draft night as well. So once they've matched the father-son bid for Dacos, they can sort of look at what they've got and then trade back into the draft as well. What they could do is, you know, flick 27 to, you know, a future pick and then sort of hide it and then trade it back in after an academy bid is matched. That's getting a little complicated and uh, probably not worth really assessing in this video, but I think they're one to watch. I think they'll be pretty active on draft night as well. So overall, I think Collingwood have done a really good job of achieving their goals in this particular trade period. Next, I'll highlight the Gold Coast Suns for having a pretty productive trade period as well. Not so much in terms of players, but again, just sort of moving their, their chess pieces around to put themselves in a good position. They funnily enough only entered the draft this year with one pick because I think they've only got one spot on the list and they're going to use the other two spots as rookie list upgrades. But the pick they have in this draft is pick three overall. So they're probably going to get uh, what is considered an elite talent with that pick. Someone like a Finn Callahan may be making his way to the Gold Coast Suns. I think it was a great signing getting Marby or Chol He's a player I think Richmond will really miss, a young key position talent that's uh, ready to play, you know, round one and beyond for them as well. Anytime the Gold Coast Suns get in a quality best 22 player, that's a massive win. And they've picked up Chol, who I think uh, will play round one for them and be a very, very good player. Who did they lose? Well, just Will Brody. But I think from the sounds of it, uh, you know, they weren't really considering him in their long-term plans. When you look at the young talent that that Gold Coast midfield has, you can't imagine Will Brody was too high up in the pecking order. They flicked away pick 19 and managed to take Will Brody's 600k off their books as well. So when you consider their squeeze on list spots, that pick 19 doesn't matter too much. And it just gives them a bit of breathing space in that salary cap as well. So overall, I think the Suns have done very well here. And as I said, Shoal's probably going to slot in and be, you know, quite an important player in their best 22 as well as a sort of backup to Jared Witts, who will hopefully come back for round one, I'd imagine, next season. And also be sort of a third tall foil for Ben King and Sam Day up forward as well. So overall, I think the Gold Coast Suns for once can be happy with the outcome of this trade period. Next, we'll talk about the Melbourne Footy Club and they weren't satisfied enough with winning the Premiership this year, but I would say they had a bit of a quiet achieving off season so far in terms of they've strengthened their best 20 through through free agency fairly cheaply by adding Luke Dunstan when Nate Jones is just retired Luke Dunstan sort of fills that spot as you know the 23rd best player on the list I'd imagine Melbourne were pretty blessed with their injury run particularly to their midfield this year from memory as well so it stands to reason that Luke Dunstan will probably play some decent footy for them next year and I think he played like half a season and got like 11 Brownlow votes this year as well so suggests that this guy does have plenty to offer at AFL level they didn't lose anyone and they also traded back into this year's first round, which is the little thing they've been doing over the last three drafts, I think. They've been trading out of the future draft into the first round of the current draft. And in 
theory, they can just keep doing that forever. So it wasn't an action-packed trade period for the Melbourne Footy Club, but when you've added some experienced midfield depth, one that can certainly offer plenty at AFL level, and then also trade back into the latter part of the first round, and I think the top 20 has got some good talent in it this year's draft, I think they can be very happy and sort of could loosely be considered a winner of this year's trade period. The fifth team that I would highlight as having a pretty good trade period would be the Adelaide Crows, who managed to recruit probably the second best talent on offer in this trade period, acquiring uh, Jordan Dawson from the Sydney Swans at what I think most people would say was a fairly decent discount. Who did they lose? Well, they lost Jake Kelly fairly early in the piece, signing as a free agent to the Essendon Footy Club. But while I think Kelly is a decent player, he's not necessarily one they'll massively miss. And bringing in Dawson as well into their defensive half is kind of an upgrade anyway. So they managed to keep that pick four on hand as well. They traded that 23 and something else as part of a big four-team trade or something like that, ended up with Melbourne's future first and gave that up for Jordan Dawson as well, which you'd have to say is unders for his talent. I guess if you had to put a negative slant on any aspect of Adelaide's trade period was the fact that they put in a massive offer to land pick one in this year's draft, Jason Horn Francis, who is likely going to be taken by North Melbourne and North Melbourne knocked that back. But I think it's a fair school of thought to suggest that with pick four this year and potentially pick one to five next year, Adelaide are probably going to recruit at least one to two elite young talents in that as well. Are they Horn Francis? No. Know, but somewhere down the track, could they convince him to come home? Maybe, maybe not. But either way, Adelaide don't lose too much out. They still have a very good draft hand in this particular draft. So those are the top five teams, I think, in terms of their productivity. Now let's talk about some losers. And again, it's probably not a title that I want to sort of really give in this video. It's also very arbitrary. How do you define losers? I mean, is it simply an analysis of what was lost versus what was gained in a trade period? Or do you sort of consider the circumstances that a club is facing? For instance, I, I would look at Fremantle as a team that certainly lost more in terms of their best 22 talent than they gained. But if we accept the fact that Adam Chera wasn't changing his mind, I think Fremantle have once again done a very good job of extracting a fair return for that. So they'll enter this year's draft with two picks in the top eight and with plenty of WA talent on offer that could land them, you know, a Neil Erasmus and a Matthew Johnson or some other Victorian kid, I'm not sure. Not only that, they got in some established talent in Will Brody and Jordan Clark. Are those guys any good? Well, it's far too early to tell, to be honest. Will Brody's had a bit of an opportunity to develop at AFL level and hasn't quite hit his mark. He may come on and be a very good player for them. Similarly, Jordan Clark has sort of been held out of Geelong's side. There's a lot of commentary about how maybe that's unfair, but you know, is he actually that good? We'll, we'll find out. We just don't know yet. But to have three picks in the top 19, Fremantle are going to have a very good chance at landing some WA kids. And I've said it in another video, but I'll be interested to see if they favor a more WA focused sort of drafting strategy. I'm not sure if I'd necessarily recommend it, but they've been burned so much over the last few years of losing kids back to Victoria and Queensland. So while I think they've been very productive in getting value for guys like Chera leaving, I think it's still probably the biggest blow of this trade period was Fremantle losing Adam Chera when he was part of a rebuild. You know, Lockie Neal leaves the club and they end up with Hogan and Lobb and Hogan's gone, Lob might be leaving. Chera was a top five pick, sort of in a crucial rebuilding part for them. Now he's out the door. So what they don't want is this to become a revolving door of talent at Fremantle. And I'll back them in, if, especially if I don't want to harp on it too much because, you know, I think they've done a good job here. But they've certainly lost more than they've gained in this trade period, I would suggest, so far. Yes, they get pick six, but what are the chances pick six ends up as good as Adam Chera? Probably less than 50-50. In terms of some other teams I'd highlight as uh, losing more than they gained, well, you look at Richmond and they're a team that's potentially going to be in transition over the next few years and they've lost Mabio Chol and Callum Coleman-Jones, two fairly decent key position talents. Yes, they brought in Robbie Tarrant and I think that's a good move. I think they should roll the dice again for another premiership. But in terms of the longer term picture, losing those guys for, you know, picks in the 20s and 30s. I'd suggest that's not ideal and I'm sure they'd rather have kept both of those players. On the flip side though, what they do have is plenty of draft picks in this particular draft to replenish those stocks. So in an ideal world, maybe they could have used some of those picks to sort of land an established A-grade player, but there weren't too many on the move in this trade period. They did have a crack at acquiring pick one for Jason Horn Francis, but were knocked back. But for them, the focus now switches to the draft and uh, I think they'll be very, very happy with the deep selections they have in the first and second rounds. Sydney were another team that weakened its best 22 when you lose Dawson and Hewitt. I'm not sure they were desperate to keep Hewitt. I think it was a sort of a win-win for all parties there when Hewitt found a suitor in Carlton. I'm not sure if Sydney really needed him long term. Jordan Dawson is a blow though. I believe they offered him a five-year contract and he's out the door as well for what you'd have to say is unders. So not a great result for the Swans there, but they did bring in Peter Laddams as well, which adds some crucial ruck forward depth for them as well. And he's, I think he's only 23, so it fits the age profile nicely. Again, I'm not comfortable with labeling Sydney or any of these teams as 
losers, but it's probably not a trade period that Sydney would want to repeat every year. I think that's a fair way to put it. And again, if we had to nitpick a team that probably didn't achieve its goals this offseason, it's nitpicky, but maybe Hawthorne. They lost Segler, brought in Max Lynch. That's fine. I'm happy with that business. It certainly freshens up and brings a sort of young edge to that list as well. But if you accept the assertion that they were trying to trade established players like Bruce and Wingard had even negotiated deals for someone like a Bruce as well and failed to get those deals done. Yeah, that's not the most successful trade period when you set out for a goal and don't achieve it. So I wouldn't go as far as to say that they'll regret not dealing Wingard and Bruce, but I'm sure they would have liked a few more picks in the top 20 range of this year's draft. Anyway, guys, that is probably it. That's probably all my thoughts on the winners and losers of this particular trade period. As always, I welcome you to let me know in the comments what you agree with, what you disagree with, what's maybe a team that I've completely missed out that you think was worth nominating. Trade period has been a huge period for the channel, guys. So uh, really appreciate all the support. You know, so many of you guys watching these videos must be fairly new to the channel as well. So I really appreciate having you guys here. Hope you stick fat with us over the journey. There's a lot of content to come, whether it be trade period, whether it be draft, whether it be next season. Stay tuned. It's going to be hot. Thanks so much, guys. Take care of yourselves, and I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.